Perfect. Well, Chad, thank you so much for being here with me today. Um, before we get started, I wanted to express my gratitude to Paul and Carol Hill for sponsoring the Venture in the Capital Summit as part of the Paul and Carol Hill Distinguished Entrepreneur Speaker Series. Thank you so much for agreeing to participate in the virtual portion of the Venture in the Capital Summit, and I'm really looking forward to learning more about the exciting work you're doing within the space industry. I'd love to start by asking you to briefly introduce yourself and to tell me a bit more about Space Capital. Uh, sure, yeah. So I'm I'm Chad Anderson, founder and managing partner at Space Capital. We are a seed stage venture capital firm investing in uh, the space economy. For us, that means that we're investing in the um, uh, uh, space-based assets that are uh, enabling the world's largest industries here on Earth, um, primarily. So. Um, yeah, I mean, there's a lot going on in space. I think most people, when they think about space, they think about the Apollo moon landings and the International Space Station, sort of these big, um, grand human achievements. But uh, we're much more focused on the entrepreneurs that are transforming nearly every major industry here on Earth using satellites and space space technologies to do that. So, um, yeah, we're based out of New York. We have um, we are actively investing out of our third fund. We have 130 million under management. Um, we are seed stage focused. So we're typically the first institutional check into a company. Um, so we're primarily, you know, investing in uh, founding teams that have an idea, maybe a prototype and are, um, you know, they've got enough of a product that they're having early conversations with um, customers that we can, you know, that are referenceable, that we can call up and get a sense for why they would like to buy this product if it comes online. So um, we get involved very early and then we sort of, you know, we help support those companies um, through their next phase of financing until they, you know, sort of uh, reach escape velocity and, and get into growth. Thank you. That, that's really helpful context. Um, before we get into the complexities of the space industry as it exists today, could you share with the audience what initially attracted you to working within this sector? Yeah, sure. So, um I am a finance and economics undergrad and an MBA, so um, I'm a business guy. I um, was managing a large real estate portfolio with with J.P. Morgan Chase through the Great Recession, which was really interesting um, time to be doing that, and uh, learned a lot and um, learned a lot in the chaos of the markets um, back then. And I came out the other side with a really interesting um uh, role waiting for me, but I wanted to do something else with my life. So um, I went to business school um, and there I was studying nascent markets and how they develop. So um, this is really like um, a market exists, but it's very limited, um, you know, uh, and at some point, uh, and the reason for that is because there's very high barriers to entry. It's difficult for new entrants to come in. Um, incumbents are sort of getting um, fat and happy um, on large contracts, and they can sort of like control the dynamics of the market and the pricing amongst themselves. You see this in oil. You've seen this, um, you know, um, uh, in horse and buggies and automobiles. And there's anyway, there's countless examples of this. And um, so I was really interested in in this, studying this, um, and this the same thing was playing out in space at the time. So that was 2012. SpaceX had just launched um, their first customer a few years before that. Uh, that was the year that they launched to the International Space Station for the first time. And suddenly a private company was doing something that, you know, um, only national superpowers had ever done before. So um, I had realized, um, you know, that something big was going on here. And I sort of did a little reading of the tea leaves and saw where things were going, right? That the barriers had been removed. The barriers were high cost. Um, of launch and difficulty, op opacity in, in pricing, like you never knew how much anything cost. There was no transparency in pricing. Um, so it was very difficult to get access to orbit and it was very expensive. Um, with SpaceX, that all went away. Um, they solved those um, issues, uh, brought those barriers to entry crashing down. And as we've seen over the last 10 years, there's now been $300 billion of investment capital in the private markets going to 2000 unique space companies based on our data. Um, so at the time there was less of a sort of, uh, of a curve, but there was enough going on there for 
for me to recognize what was happening and draw parallels to uh, industries of the past. And so, um, right. So then I needed to get smart about what's happening. Um, and I actually volunteered my time with Astrobotic. Um, so uh, I identified them as a really strong, technically capable team. Uh, the Google Lunar X Prize was going on at the time and um, they were the clear leaders um, in that prize. And so, you know, doing a quick survey of, of global activity, like that's where most of it was happening. Country um, groups from all over the world were competing in that. And so um, Astrobotic was at the forefront of that. And I volunteered my time to sort of help them um, think through some of the business aspects and sizing up the market. Um, got kind of a crash course in um, lunar transportation and um, wrote some papers there, wrote some papers at, at school talking about um, the impact of, of SpaceX and the future of public private partnerships. And yeah, so sort of just jumped off the deep end. And then um, uh, I was a business guy who um, identified an opportunity, right? All these new companies that were coming on uh, that SpaceX was enabling all these new entrants, they were going to need capital. There weren't, um, there wasn't any serious business people outside of the few big players, um, uh, SpaceX and a couple of others. Um, there was nobody on the investment side, serious business people on the investment side. I knew that these companies were going to need capital. So um, decided to start a, um, a fund focused on, on um, helping to um, facilitate the flow of capital to these companies. Um, I was still business background and I knew enough about the technical side now to sort of meet someone halfway. Um, and that's when I partnered up with my partner, Tom Ingersoll, who is an experienced, um, you know, an advanced satellite and rocketry expert and um, has a lot of experience as an operator. And he's built and sold multiple venture backed space businesses. So he's the technical guy who knows, you know, enough about the business side to, to, to meet me halfway. And so we made a good team. That's incredible. Uh, you touched on this a bit, but obviously the space industry presents an incredible opportunity. Morgan Stanley, in fact, estimated that the space industry could generate revenue of more than a trillion dollars by 2040. In your recent book, which you have behind you, The Space Economy, which we'll get into a bit more later, you also described space as the greatest business opportunity of our lifetime. What, in your opinion, are the most compelling reasons to build in space? And can you share any promising potential applications that the industry has not yet fully explored? Yeah, that's a big question. Um, so every time I hear, um, uh, you know, the the numbers put out by um, Morgan Stanley or, or Bank of America or who have you, you know, um, whoever else, um, uh, I think that these are really understated figures. And the reason I say that is because it really all comes down to how you define a space company and how you view the opportunity set, right? So, um, I mean, I started, you know, the first question, I touched on this a little bit, but it's really about like how people view uh, what is a space company and what isn't. And most people, you know, a lot of people, when they come in, they come in with preconceived notions, thinking that it's just, you know, the stuff that's happening in emerging um, areas like lunar transportation or commercial space stations, you know, human space flight. All that's really fun and interesting stuff. Um, we're following that. It's very exciting to see. It's great that, you know, we've got more people experiencing that. And there's a lot of buzz and excitement about what's happening there. Um, I do think that there's opportunity in these emerging areas, but that really accounts for like 1% of, of the activity in the space economy today. And that's like, you know, it doesn't matter how you how you measure it, whether it be revenue or investment dollars or or just, you know, activity, basic business activity. You know, it's really 90 percent of of everything that's going on in the space economy today is is uh, in satellites. And that's GPS, geospatial intelligence and satellite communications. These are the three um, key satellite technology stacks. They're the invisible backbone that powers the world's largest industries today. And um, a lot of the way that we think about this comes from our foundational thesis paper, uh, the GPS playbook, which we published several years ago. GPS is the most successful space technology 
in existence. Um, it has generated trillions of dollars in economic value and some of the largest venture returns that we've ever seen. Um, how did it do that? Right. So we look at the, the history and where we are currently and where things are headed. You know, Lockheed built um, the GPS satellites for the government. They were um, these were, you know, hardware that was built by the government for the government military purposes. It was actually um, off limits to anyone else by design um, until companies in the 80s like Trimble and Garmin built commercial GPS receivers to harness this signal and make it easily accessible to the tech community in California and other places who then built applications on top of this really valuable data. So uh, location-based services to leverage the GPS signal to give us the applications that now help us get where we're going to deliver our food to us, to, you know, the, um, to power our financial markets and coordinate times internationally and, and across the globe. And that's why GPS is so important to our global economy today is um, most people think of the dot on the map, but it's really, you know, the timing pieces is, is equally important. Synchronizing um, and coordinating uh, times and now allows for international transactions, transactions with people who are over the horizon. So, um, right. So, so uh, applications is a key piece of the puzzle. It's where a lot of the value um, accrues and um and I think, you know, as time goes on and as this category gets um, larger and more people are paying attention, I think that framework is really helpful in understanding the breadth of the opportunity here. Um, but still, so many people want to just focus on on the space infrastructure piece. And I think, you know, the infrastructure is as in any um, in any category is really important. Um, you can't have software without the hardware to run it on. Um, but to focus only on the infrastructure and not focus, then you're you're focusing really on the supply and you're not focusing on the market demand and the actual end customers and the users of you know the the products that come from from this infrastructure. So um, that framework has been really helpful for us in understanding how big this could be. Um, location based services is a thirty six billion dollar market today. Um, so. Uh, we're seeing now the same thing play out in geospatial intelligence, right? So um, this is the Earth observation satellites, like the imaging satellites, uh, whether it be cameras or radar to see through clouds and at night or other sensor types. Um, but SpaceX removed the barriers to entry. Suddenly we see all these new entrants coming in, um, raising capital and um, building small satellites and launching these distributed networks of small satellites. Um, there's many companies that are that are doing this now. They're generating this unprecedented amount of new data that is now um, uh, companies like uh, Skywatch in our portfolio are aggregating this data from all these different players um, and structuring the data and making it easily accessible through an API. So they're kind of doing what Trimble did for GPS. Um, and now we're starting to see the first geospatial applications being built on top of this really valuable data set by um, people and uh, companies that understand the end customer um, and understand how to tap into an API, but don't necessarily need to know orbital mechanics or how the satellites work. So we think that that opportunity is as big, if not bigger than the location-based services market today. Um, it's just getting started. And then we haven't even covered satellite communications, which is probably the you know bigger than than the previous two combined, um, with SpaceX's Starlink and Amazon Kuiper and OneWeb and uh, the Chinese uh, uh, Starlink-like constellations. I mean, we're going to be having you know we're going to go from a couple thousand satellites to tens of thousands of satellites, if not a hundred thousand satellites, um, uh, connecting the remote places on the planet, which enables all kinds of interesting applications. Um, uh, for remote operations and uh, rural living and moving outside of the city and basically um, bringing the other 4 billion people um, online, bringing billions of consumers and enterprises online, right? So when you start to add all of these things up, um, you start to look at a trillion dollars in revenue and you think like, 
maybe we're already there. Right. That makes a lot of sense. Uh, actually, during the live portion of our event, we had the honor of hosting Tim Hughes and Delian of Varda Space Industries. And Delian's company is interesting in that he's identified the opportunity to uh, manufacture pharmaceutical ingredients in a, you know, a low gravity environment. Would be curious, like how you think about manufacturing in space. And I know Jeff Bezos has been a big proponent of moving industry into space, and then Earth being, you know, sort of more light industry and residential. You know, what do you think about the opportunities to expand there as well? Yeah. So um, these are big ideas that we're working for. I think um, the important thing um, for anyone when they're thinking about their career or thinking about these types of goals to associate them with themselves with, or as an investor, certainly, right? We're, we're a VC fund that are working with funds that have 10-year lives. So um, uh, it is important to think about working towards this long-term vision and taking, um, and taking steps to get there, right? So um, that is a big, bold vision, right? To be moving millions, billions, I don't know how many they said last time, both um, uh, Bezos and Musk have both said the same thing, right? Like moving a lot of people out um, off of Earth's surface and into, you know, onto other planetary bodies who are living in space. Um, these are big, big goals, um, uh, obviously, and, and hugely aspirational, and they're fun to work towards. They're not going to happen overnight. Um, and I think that they would tell you the same thing, right? That these are, um, you know, that, that, that these are things that we're doing whatever we can now to work towards. And it's going to be something that happens over generations. But, um, as an investor, it's like, what, what makes sense now? Um, so putting it all kind of into context, right. The, um, we, the way that we divide up the space economy is we've talked a lot about satellites. There's obviously, you know, and that's like 89% of what's going on. Launch is another, like, I don't know, nine or 10% of what's going on. Um, those are markets that exist today. Um, there is government and commercial customers for all of that. Um, they're more evolved, you know, um, the different sectors underneath them are, are more or less evolved, right? Like um, GPS is more mature than geospatial, but like all of these are addressing um, markets that exist today. And there's enterprise and government customers and consumer customers for all of that. Um, then you've got emerging areas like emerging industries. Uh, we call them, you know, commercial uh, space stations, um, lunar uh, markets, uh, logistics. So like space traffic management and space domain awareness and servicing and that sort of thing. Um, and industrials. So um, manufacturing is in this sort of 1% of future markets uh, that is currently primarily dominated by government dollars. Um, almost everything in these emerging um, industries is underpinned by government dollars. There's government budgets, and they're the first mover here. They want a technology. They're looking to develop this technology. There's commercial companies that are willing to build this if, they, if they'll if they put some money up as an initial customer. And that's what we're starting to see, right? Um, uh, in manufacturing specifically, it's, um, uh, it's an interesting one because there are a lot of ideas, and we're not quite sure which ones make economic sense yet. Um, I think Delian certainly has an idea, um, and and I like the way that he's thinking about it. Um, there has been, you know, other companies have come um, and gone. Other companies are just getting started, and they're focused on, you know, manufacturing different things. What makes sense to manufacture in orbit um, economically, right? Because you've got to pay for the launch to get up there, and then you've got to pay for whatever manufacturing process. Like, do you need to launch your equipment and get it installed on a, on a space station somewhere? And then do you need to train people on the ground or do you need to launch them and then train them in orbit? Or do you need to like do a virtual teleconference and like tell them how to do whatever it is that they need to do? And then they need to do the manufacturing for you and then you need to package it up. And then you need to figure out down mass, right? So you're yeah. adding a whole lot of cost to the equation. Um, so what... Uh, things can you produce that give you enough of a benefit to justify that cost? I think that that um, list of things is still currently very short. Definitely. Pharmaceuticals um, is definitely one where 
uh, it starts to get really interesting. And so I like what they're doing over at Florida. 100%. And I think it'll also be interesting to see how they can figure out and improve the infrastructure around reentry, because I know that that's like a huge bottleneck for them right now. Um, I'd love to learn a little bit more about how you're thinking about innovative applications of technology in this industry. Um, we've seen a lot around 3D printing technology being used within space companies. Uh, do you think that 3D printing will play a role in bringing down production costs? And you know, what other technologies are you excited about? Yeah, um, 3D printing is uh, great for a lot of reasons. Um, you know, because you can start to think about, especially if you start to think about, you know, future use cases, again, like way off in the future where we start to like, at the moment we can launch feed stock. It's easier to launch feed stock. You know, it's like, um, it can withstand like much harsher sort of launch conditions. You can use a variety of different launches or different ways to get to where you want to go. Um, feed stock is easier to ship, right? And then you can um, print things. Um, also like at the moment, it's sort of like a remote location that's getting easier to get to it's a lot easier today than it was yesterday but it's still kind of difficult and remote place to get to the on the space station for example so you know like having the ability to print things that you need that you don't have or that you forgot or you know didn't make it you know to for you know launch complications or whatever like yeah it's nice it's it's nice i think that there's um opportunity there um certainly um, what does the business model look like? I don't know. How difficult is the technology? Um, it's tough to say. Uh, like what makes a 3D printer in space different than a 3D printer on Earth? Um, I'm not sure it's um, uh, a vastly more complicated machine. Um, so it's interesting, you know. Um, it's interesting. Um, what are my... Um, what am I most interested in? I don't know. I mean, if we're talking about um, emerging areas, um, there's a couple of things. One is this year is going to be huge for lunar transportation. There is a big push to get back to the moon and and stay there and build an orbital outpost. You know, something similar to the the, the space station today where you've got a permanent outpost there and there's a rotating crew that goes through. And that's very exciting. Um, it feels very sort of tangible and near term. Um, and we've got a number of companies that are attempting to go and land uh, this year. So that's really fun. Um, and obviously Starship. Um, yeah, everything that we've so, I mean, everything that we've seen so far, right, over the last decade plus is like all of the entrepreneurial activity, all this commercial innovation, all of this investment activity, it's all on the heels of SpaceX. Um, and it's because like, that's the only reason why we're even having this conversation um, is because of them. And so we're kind of like, if you look at where we've come over the last 10 years, like every chart is like this exponential, like the front end of a, of a super cycle. And that's all based on a Falcon 9 launch paradigm. And it's because like, People always underestimate um, what just lower cost and ease of access will do for innovation, right? And that's what the Falcon 9 did. Um, and now we're entering a new era with, you know, when Starship comes online, it is going to order, bring the, the cost down by another order of magnitude. It's going to make, there's going to be, because it's fully rapidly reusable, there's going to be many more launches on a regular cadence. So it's going to be infinitely more accessible and infinitely lower cost. Um, and it's fun to start to think about what that means for existing markets and satellites and being able to launch um, uh, at a, you know, um, whatever infrastructure that you need, but also um, to start to think about how that vehicle could be used. Um, you know, we're seeing people build space stations and launching, you know, and booking launches on Starship. And if you think about it, You've got a state a space station that is built to be the size of Starship and fit right inside in a shell. And so you start to think like, um, what would it take? Like, why is someone else building a station to put inside of a station and launch together when like that start, you know, because the human landing system like includes um, Starship and that 
you know, is going to be human rated and could be a station on its own. And you start to think about the implications there for large scale manufacturing in orbit and the ability to um, avoid all those costs that we talked about earlier, right? Like go out to Starbase in Texas and bring your people and your equipment and kit it out while you're on the ground and then launch everything that you need, your trained employees and all your equipment and all your raw materials and do whatever it is that you need to do. And then you've got down mass already figured out. Like it's really kind of um, like as investors, we see this coming and we're really excited about what's going to, what, you know, all the records, all the launch records and everything we've seen over the last 10 years, like all of that is going to look minuscule um, in the next few years. And so we're looking to see what comes next. And we're really excited to like find founders who are building for this new world and like are building for a world with Starship. And the crazy thing is it's like, um, there aren't a whole lot of people with great ideas that are building for that yet. Maybe it's because, you know, they need to see it come online first before they go all in. Um, but I think it's also just sort of a lack of imagination. It's really hard for us to understand how something like a step change of this magnitude is going to change things. And so, um, what do, you, what do they say to, to achieve you first have to conceive? And I think we have a hard time doing that. Definitely. I feel like it's going to be a very exciting few years for the space industry, so I'm excited to follow along. Uh, you touched a little bit on lunar infrastructure. Uh, NASA awarded ICON, an advanced construction technology company focused on 3D printed homes, a $57 million contract to develop infrastructure on the moon, including landing pads, habitats, and roads. Um, Exarch's subsidiary Astroport is reportedly developing moon bricks to construct landing pads, and in August 2023, DARPA announced Luna 10 to guide development of integrated lunar infrastructure over the next decade. Further, the moon is seen as a gateway to deep space. What infrastructure is currently being built on the moon, and how will this infrastructure unlock new possibilities? Yeah, cool, right? Um very cool. This is definitely this is definitely one of like the top um uh, out there ideas that's probably a lot more near term than than most people think. Um so what are we building on the moon? Nothing at the moment. Um we have a lot of ideas. Um we're building I mean, it's like um uh uh Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? Like first of all, you have to get there. We're still trying to do that. It's very difficult, right? Um, more and more people are doing that. We've crashed a bunch of things into it recently. Um, I think, you know, we are going to see a soft landing, um, multiple soft landings this year, probably. And we will see the first um, uh, commercial privately funded company soft land this year, which is pretty exciting. Um, but let's just say that um, they're successful, right? And um, I know Astrobotic the best, so you know I can talk a little bit about, um, I follow them um, the most closely, and so I can talk um, about what I know, what they're doing, and you know what they've said publicly. But the idea there is you know, um, that they are a lander. Um, they land and they deliver payloads, right? So on this um, prior mission um, that didn't quite get to the moon, um, they had several different payloads on it. Some of those were government rovers and they had commercial rovers as well. Um, and they, you know, you start to think about uh, services that you can offer these customers of yours once you deliver them to the surface. Well, the first is they could all be building all these rovers and all these, you know, packages that you're delivering to the surface. They could all build their own communications packages or, you know, you do what Astrobotic did and provide um, a Wi-Fi capability, right? So then they can all sort of tap into your, the fact that you're a larger piece of infrastructure on the surface. Um, you've got an antenna that's already communicating back to earth. And so they can just tap into that and leverage what you've got. So comms, like, you know, hierarchy of needs, right? Comms is pretty important. Um, uh, then you start thinking about, you know, power. Um, you know, uh, a lander could then unfurl its um, uh, solar panels and generate electricity. And it's not doing a whole lot of activity anymore. So it can then, you know, there could be a wireless charging or, you know, docking ports or something like that for the rovers and their customers to use to uh, recharge. So um, 
And then you start to think about, you know, where do you go from there? And um, obviously the goal is, you know, through the Artemis program is to develop an outpost that's permanently crewed and um, with a rotating crew. So um, what do they need? You know, you need mobility. You need um, you need to be able to get around. You need to be able to move um, uh, equipment and supplies around. You need roads probably for that or do you i don't know um you know people are developing hoppers and all kinds of things but you probably need some sort of track road for them to get around on you probably need more power so starting to roll out um other solar panels that can then um harvest the sun's energy and store it so then you need batteries and that sort of thing um launching and landing pads right if you want to have transportation not just mobility on the surface but back and forth um, that's going to be pretty important um, obviously the habitat. Um, so, uh, you know, you just kind of work through, um, uh, the icon contract is super cool. You know, they're 3d printing houses, um, in Texas and other places, and they're going to do, you know, they're going to use that same technology, their 3d printer on, on the lunar surface. There's other folks that are, that are going after that as well. Um, but in the end of the day, um, there's a lot of people who want to do this, um, and you can't do any of it until you got a ride. Right. That's fascinating. So I want to move on to like the funding side of this and sort of where space capital um, sits in the space industry. Who is funding the space industry? And, you know, how do you founders navigate raising both from VC funds versus securing government contracts and grants, which are obviously non-dilutive capital? And, and, you know, besides space capital, be curious to get your take on what other VC firms stand out and their willingness to invest in space companies. Yeah. So, okay. There's, um, like I said, according to our data, so we publish, um, space IQ, the space investment quarterly, we've been publishing it for a number of years now. And, um, uh, we've got a very comprehensive data set on, you know, where the dollars are going geographically, who's investing into what, um, this provides really useful, helpful insights for us as a team to sort of chew through every quarter and try to understand the trends and what's going on. So um, that's where, um, you know, and it's all for free, too. So you can check it out on our, on our website if you if you're interested. There's also an interactive data set so you can play around with it and come up, you know, with your own conclusion. Um, but it's it's um, that's that's what I'm going to base my response on. So um VC makes up a large portion of uh, private equity investment into the space economy. Um, it accounts for almost three fourths of all of the all of the rounds, investment rounds that happen, all the financing rounds, and two thirds of all the capital. So VC is a very important player in uh, the space economy, and um, you know I think. Again, it all comes down to definitions. So if you want to focus, um, there are funds that focus only on space infrastructure and they have a very sort of narrow view of what the space economy is. And that is a very difficult thing to do. Actually, a lot of folks who um, uh, who are uh, investing in this category and say that they're focused on this category, a lot of them have put all their money to work in infrastructure, which makes for a very um uh undiversified portfolio um and and makes for uh uh challenging times especially through market cycles so i would say that you think about the way that we think about investing in this is to understand you know we bring a lot of expertise um as um category um, specialists here we have um built and sold multiple space businesses we have launched um and landed rockets we have founded companies that have assets that are currently in orbit and are generating revenue we understand the technology um uh, and we also understand you know on the, on the infrastructure side we also understand um how the markets are leveraging this this uh infrastructure to 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 make um applications and and things that that the market wants and so i think it's that understanding and 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 investing across all of the different industries and all the um the you know the technology layers the infrastructure and the distribution the applications is what gives us the ability to um 
uh, aggregate the, the the most value from from space based technologies, right? So I think a lot of people um, are actively investing in this category without giving it like without understanding that that's what they're doing. Um, I think that um, uh, you know a thought exercise that I like to 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 do is um, if you were to uh, randomly, you know, you walk into the Uber cafeteria and you just randomly survey people who are having lunch that work there and you say, you know, do you work for a space company? Um, I think that you would find a bunch of people there who are like, what are you talking about? Right. Like I just write software and um, uh, what are you talking about? No, I don't I don't know what you mean. But you'd find a whole group of people who. Um, who all they do their entire job all day every day is to understand the GPS signal, how it's like refracting off of buildings and and the challenges with getting a signal from orbit and keeping it accurate and and reliable and resilient. They would say yes, absolutely, we're for a space company. Like that's what I spend all my time doing. So, um, so I think that um, that at the end of the day, that uh, uh, that there is a lot of a lot of capital that's going into these companies. It's not that um, the the opportunity here is like much broader than most people think. And I think it kind of like, if you use the analogy of GPS, right? Like so many people use it on a day-to-day -day basis and no one really gives it the credit it deserves. Cause it's like I said, the invisible backbone. It happens in the background. Then it powers everything that we do all day, every day, but no one really, you know, takes the time to say like, oh, this is space helping me. Right. I'd like to learn a little bit more about your portfolio companies and where you're focusing your time right now. Can you tell us a bit about what investments you've made lately and how they align with the emerging trends you're seeing in the industry? Yeah, sure. Um, so fun one. Um, so AI is... Um, 2023 was the year of AI. Everyone was experimenting with it. And I think that 2024 is going to be an even bigger year where it starts to get integrated into enterprise workflows um, as the MAG7 and the big the big tech companies like um, uh, build um, AI products, you know, that um, where people already have accounts and, you know, have the security and stuff that, pe that enterprises, you know, need. So I think that um, 2024 is going to be a big year for AI. Um, everybody knows that we need a ton of data to train AI. Um, real data has a lot of limitations. Um, there's not enough of it to go around. Um, it's often very expensive. There's a lot of reasons why real data is not sufficient. There's not enough of it or it's not sufficient to address all of our needs for um, uh for training the AI that we want to train. So um, Rendered AI is a company that has built a, a synthetic data platform as a service. And synthetic data is physics-based. This is not like generative AI um, LLMs, right? Where you're sort of taking um, uh, anything in and sort of trying to pull something valuable out the other side. Synthetic-based means that you're like, basing your training like your base data on actual physics and how things look so um they're focused on computer vision so ai is going through a period where uh language is great but you know humans like in the human brain which we're modeling a lot of this off of does it does a lot of its learning through visual and so will our ai um so they're focused on the most important piece um Gartner thinks that, you know, 90 plus percent of all AI is going to be trained on synthetic data um, in the not too distant future. So um, this one's, you know, really interesting because their market is uh, everything for AI, right? Like they have customers that are that are using their platform for all kinds of things that aren't space related. But um, space is their beachhead market because Earth observation companies have been dealing with massive, you know, data sets for years and they know that they need this already. So um so anyway so that's a fun one um and then the other one i'll probably you know uh, have several fun ones but um you tell me how much time we have Tehan space is one that's worth talking about we are going from 
all of this growth means that we are going from like 1500 or 2000 satellites in orbit to tens of thousands, if not, you know, hundreds of thousands of satellites in the very near future. So we've gone from zero to 60 very fast. Um, and the way in which, uh, space traffic coordination, space traffic management is happening today is like, it will blow your mind. It's like you sit behind your desk, watching your emails, waiting to see if you get a collision alert or something like that. Right. And then you like, then you need to email back or get someone on the phone, look them up, like and coordinate this way. It's all super manual. Um, so we need a better solution. Um, so the first thing to do is to understand where things are in orbit. So a fund one portfolio company is Leo Labs. You know, they've built a network of ground-based radars that are able to track, you know, very small things in orbit. Uh, they now have the best, most comprehensive data set out there on where things are or, you know, um, operational satellites and debris. So that's step one. But then um, Kahan does the really important piece. Um, uh, they have satellite operators as customers and they're, um, building a UI that is um, uh, the network and coordination piece, right? So there is a, a, a collision alert um, and it optimizes, right? Like what should these two satellites do so that they can minimize fuel expenditure and minimize um, orbital disruption, right? So they don't have to like go way off course and come way back. Um, so there's a lot to be done there in terms of optimizing and coordination, um, not just amongst, you know, satellite players in the U S but um, there's a lot of satellites being launched from a lot of different countries. And we need a, a way in which everyone can coordinate because this is a global commons, right? Um, base is a, is a global commons that is essential for every country's economic stability and national security. So we need to make sure that, it continues to, you know, we continue to maintain safe operating or orbits and Leo Labs and Kahan are both a key part of that. Um, that's like just going to continue growing as um as an area that we need to to focus on. Wow, that's fascinating. And it's interesting to see like all the, the second order effects and then how you address those as um, space becomes more populated with satellites. Yeah. Um, Seeing as this is, you know, the venture in the Capitol Center at Georgetown geared towards an undergraduate audience, uh, I'd like to take a second to ask you what advice you have for students who are interested in getting involved in the space industry, and perhaps maybe touching on how the emerging space industry will provide opportunities for students and recent graduates to get involved. Yeah. I mean, so first of all, um, it's a hugely exciting field. There's so much going on, um, you know, Timing is everything. We touched on this a little bit earlier. Timing is everything in life. Like as you think about your career, you don't want to be, you don't want to jump into something and, you know, find something really cool and be 20 years too early. Um, you know, likewise, you don't want to wait until um, it's been around for a long time and like you sort of missed the boat and you like, because you're going to miss out on a lot of opportunity to get involved early to help shape the direction of where things are going to, you know, play a meaningful role and hopefully like, you know, carve off a piece of that for yourself. Um, and we are right in a sweet spot with the space economy today, right? So we've been operating in space for decades, but it's only recently become a category for entrepreneurship and innovation and investment. It's literally just like a 10 years old. Um, again, all on the heels of SpaceX, you know, when they launched their first customer in 2009, but then it even took a few years for things to, to start to get rolling, right? So 2015, in our minds, is kind of where a lot of this stuff started to take off. Um, 2015 to now, that's, you know, it's not even 10 years. So, right. but there's enough going on here, right? That you're not starting from scratch. You don't have to build everything yourself. Um, you know, there's 2000 unique space companies, right? There's a ton of opportunity here. Um, and you're still getting in early enough where you can help influence things. And this is a really great place to be um, spending your time. And I think that, um, and it's something that's like, for sure, it is um, essential to our global economy is going to continue to play an important role going forward. I mean, the next, like it is, we're not going to decline from here, like activity in orbit, the importance of this, these technologies and what we do with them, it's only going to increase over the next few years. So, or sorry, the next few decades. So this is definitely a place to like, think about, you know, planning some roots and like carving off a place for yourself and getting involved. 
Um, you want to be um, in a growing area. You want to be in an exciting area. And I think this affords all of that. And then the last thing I'd say too, is that there's just something for everyone. It doesn't matter your discipline, right? Like in the very early days, it was very narrow. Like they just needed technologists and STEM focused, you know, students to come and sort of build things um, when the market was very limited and there was just one government customer. Today, there's all kinds of customers, there's all kinds of things being built and these companies need everyone um, from every discipline um, supporting them. So um, if you are interested, we operate a free um, talent platform called Space Talent. Yeah. Yeah. No, you got your company does a really great job of putting together opportunities to work in the space industry. I'll let you expand on it. Yeah. No, thank you. Um. So you know, it's it's something again. It's a it's a free resource. Um. Uh. That we make available, and the idea is to try and help um people understand, you know, sort of like remove the the veil here. Um, and show um, the types of opportunities that are available. So there's a jobs board. So you can definitely like globally, you can sort it. Like, are you only interested in the infrastructure? Are you only interested in launch or satellites or lunar or whatever? You can you can slice and dice, you know, the jobs, however you want by geography. It's also a global list. Um, so all the jobs um, should be there. So you can find them all in one place. But then we also... Um, uh, put a lot of, of, of pieces out. Like uh, we do space talent spotlights where we talk to people at all stages of their career of they've got a cool job in space. Like how did that happen? And you can learn from people. Um, you know, they're telling their authentic stories of, you know, how they got an internship, um, how they uh, got their first job, you know, and these are like everyone in all different levels, you know, like, mid managers, entrepreneurs who have been super successful, entrepreneurs who have struggled, um, interns, you know, you name it. Like we've got a, a ton of resources available on space talent for you to um for you to like get all the questions that you have answered. And it's not just from us telling you, it's from, you know, everyone else out there who's lived it themselves. That's incredible. It's great how much of an ecosystem you've put together. Um, you know, as we're wrapping up, I'd like to give you the opportunity to share any other messages um, to potential readers who are showing interest in your book, The Space Economy. Yeah, thanks. Um, you know, I, uh, why is a VC firm who trades on our um, expertise and insights, like why are we putting out a book with all of them in it? Um, the idea is to attract more bright people to dedicate their time and their careers to building here. Um, it's the idea is to sort of, again, like put all of our research together in one place. Um, the frameworks that we've developed to help us understand how big the opportunity in the space economy is. Um, you know, we've put all those together in this, in this book. The idea is, you know, it's supposed to be, it's it's written to be a very easy read to give you sort of like a one on one one on one of like what is this um why is it interesting how big is it like where are the boundaries here and like also everyone knows something about space right like we've all we know about the Apollo moon landings we know about the International Space Station but like what else is out there like what's NASA's role versus you know private enterprise and private investors and that sort of thing so it's meant to be. Um, a guide for investors, entrepreneurs, um, and aspiring, you know, career professionals to sort of help you find your way. So hopefully it, it helps you do that. Definitely. Well, Chad, thank you so much for being so generous with your time um, and joining us for the Venture and the Capital Summit. We'd love to have you in person next year if you're you know, willing to make the trip to DC. Um, but, you know, thank you again. We really appreciate it. Sounds great. Thank you.